Hey, uh, welcome everyone this morning. Um, uh, we're very pleased uh, that uh, we have uh, Dr. Jeff Wilson, um, Superintendent of the Claremont School District, United uh, Unified School District, who will be speaking on the uh, on the impact of the pandemic in California uh, public schools. Uh, Jeff, thank you so much for being here and I'll just turn it over to you. Okay, thank you so much for the uh, introduction and the invitation to be with you today. Uh, if I run into any glitches along the way, just be patient. I'm, I'm using an iPad, so sharing the content of the screen is a little bit more difficult, but I'm gonna shift over to a uh, a presentation here that uh, I've prepared. So give me one second. Okay, so I should be able to go to my screen now. Okay. And good morning. Uh, as mentioned, my name is uh, Jeff Wilson and been here in uh, Claremont now for just under a year, and it's been a wonderful experience. Um, I've spent uh, over 30 years in education between being a uh, teacher and then uh, assistant principal, principal for quite a few years, still my favorite job ever. Um, assistant principal of educational services with our Katy Unified School District, where we were able to do some um, amazing innovative work over there, including a, you know, put together a lab school to, to test a lot of things. Um, and then moved into the superintendency role where I sit now. So these last uh, couple of years have been challenging, of course, for everyone, uh, certainly in education, K-12 education, uh, it's been the most challenging time. In fact, uh, retired older superintendents uh, smile a lot. <laughs> I'm very thankful that uh, they made that decision to leave prior to the pandemic. It's, it's been overwhelming, in, uh, but it's been exciting. I, and I don't mean to, to say that it's just been negative, but I think there's a great deal of positive uh, you know, energy that's come out of uh, what we've gone through here. So today I wanna to speak uh, on emerging from the pandemic, the changing landscape of public education in California. I've got uh, quite a bit to cover. I'll do my best to get there. So I may rush some stuff, uh, but I wanna uh, allow some time at the end for a few questions. So the, the question really is for us is where are we going? And, and let me do a check. Can you see my screen? Yes. yes. Beautiful, thank you. Uh, so where are we going in K-12 education and what is the lasting impact of COVID-19 had on school? So I'm gonna, I'm about to get out of the screen, I believe to see this video. So um, be right with you here on that. I got it all queued up. Ignore the commercial at the beginning. I'll skip it as soon as I can, but it's a quick little hitter on sort of this idea of education 4.0, transforming the future of education through advanced technology. So here we go. I remember the teacher talked and we listened. We had to memorize quite Can a lot too. Can you hear that? A lot of time was spent giving out books and collecting them up again. We were sitting in rows in desks so we could see the board better because talk and chalk was the way. There must be an industrial revolution in education in which educational science and the ingenuity of educational technology combine to modernize the grossly inefficient and clumsy procedures of conventional education. Sydney L. Presse, 1924. These young people are studying in a new way. A computing calculator designed for use in high school classrooms has created tremendous excitement among educators. The tool which has made this possible is the high-speed digital computer operating with electronic precision on great quantities of information. If we think about the third industrial revolution, that was PCs and the internet, and, and we've just about caught up with that. The fourth industrial revolution is what becomes possible from those technologies. Industry 4.0 is the next big shift in the way that manufacturing operates. Digital know-how is going to be hugely important and then people will need to be flexible because the world will change. At the future workplace and future societies, uh, we're still moulding them as we go and technology is one of the main pillars in what is shaping what the future will look like. The pace of change is remarkable. With the introduction of these exponential technologies, creating a paradigm shift to create Education 4.0. Lectures aren't fit for purpose anymore. Using textbooks and teaching in 
a Victorian sort of method with rows of students, you know, listening to the teacher, taking notes. It's obsolete. We need to use our time in lessons to actually have those meaningful mentoring one-to-ones that can never be replaced. The technology gives us that time if we use it correctly. Rather than being something that's scary, we can use technology to be something that's very liberating for people so that instead of having to yeah, go through the rigmarole of institutional learning as it's been in the past, we can actually use smart robotics, smart computers to make learning more accessible to more people and to actually tailor it to individual needs. This whole cluster of AI technologies will make learning for students more rewarding, teaching for academics more rewarding, we want it to be a win for everybody. We've shown already in clinical studies and trials that retention is up to 70% higher in virtual reality. That has a huge impact on learning and retention of facts. The challenge is for universities to really develop their students' digital skills so that they can actually make use of those skills in the workplace. It would be all too easy to say everyone must learn to code. But the truth is, coding is just one digital skill. Creativity, collaboration, communication, critical thinking, these skills that can never be automated, that can never be replaced, are what we need to focus on. Education 4.0 is a, is a request to the education sector to rethink the educational paradigm. And it's an opportunity for us, as this fourth industrial revolution kicks off, to think about what modern education should look like. We now live in a hyper-connected world, and now the time, more than ever, the time is for us to say, what do we want to do with that? Okay. Great, so let me get back to my PowerPoint here. So I've done a little uh, little background here on the prominent milestones in American education system. And, and I really struggle with what to put in here or not put in here. Obviously there could be so much more, but what I wanted to concentrate on is sort of the iterations that have happened in American education over time. So we began our great educational experiment with relatively few entitled individuals having access to an education. You know, mainly male children headed for a life in the professions or ministry. Um, and they were taught by, in, you know, individually or in small clusters with individual feedback on performance. And really the only form of assessing competence or learning was provided by the teacher or the tutor individually and reported out to uh, interested parties, be it a Harvard University College or an, a college or um, even in, in industry. So grading... Uh, was introduced, if you see there, in 1785. So first of all, we, our first real, you know, grammar school was in, in the 1600s. And the first textbook, the New England Primer, was printed in 1690. It was in, you know, 1734 that the idea of this sort of drill and kill of rote memory and re reciting uh, really came into play. Um, as we kind of move down through this, this time scale, it wasn't until 1785 that Yale faculty created a grade scale uh, with four descriptors. And then the legend uh, is that this Cambridge tutor, William Farish, assigned grades for the first time using the A, A through F model and modeled it on the manufacturing model. And really it was to increase his income because tutors at that time were paid by the number of students that they could accommodate. And so essentially standardized grading was put into place to be able to allow uh, teachers and tutors to uh, really to deal with more students. Um, we see seat time in 1905, and by the way, I skipped the whole 1800s, I recognize that. What I'm really concentrating on is sort of this narrative that leads to where uh, we're talking about today with regards to the next iteration. But seat time really came into play with the Carnegie unit in 1905, where it was equated to high school credits. We all know John Dewey came along in the early 1900s and his shadow looms large even today and really began that discussion of the progressive education movement. Uh, it was entering World War I that uh, standardized testing sort of reared its first uh, ugly head, and it was used to identify um, the, the intellectual abilities of Army recruits. Um, again, we big jump in history here, but Cole's book, The Open Classroom, uh, probably some of those on the line today remember the open classroom days. Um, I was a young guy, but I was aware of that, and it was an approach that I don't think America was quite ready for. 
but it was about student student centered classrooms and active holistic learning, a lot of which we're talking about today. Um, the back to basics movement in the 70s when I was in uh, elementary, middle and beginning my high school career, uh, again, stressing back to the basics, reading, uh, writing, arithmetic. Piaget in 70, uh, again, gave a shot in the arm of a progressive movement of education towards discovery-based teaching approach, approaches. And then 77, I was in high school when the first Apple II came out. And uh, I remember going off to, to college and learning to program, if you remember the, the language basic and Fortran, uh, you know, that came shortly thereafter. 83, of course, The Nation at Risk was published, uh, which stressed that we needed to concentrate on computer science. Perkins Act was in 84. We're still getting monies from the Perkins Act today to incentivize vocational technical education. A um, couple other things as we read down through here. Um, Netscape, how many of us remember 1994 was really the first commercial web browser from Mozilla and 80% of the users were, were on Netscape there. And just in that same year, the first online high school was founded. It, then of course, 98, we get to Google and, and really we haven't turned back from that to this day here. Uh, no Child Left Behind came back into place, another iteration of the back to basics movement, um, demanding accountability, high stakes testing, penalties for schools, not making adequate yearly progress, which really you know was, was looming over us up to the beginning of the pandemic with our singular scores and, and having to uh, report back to state agencies on our adequate yearly progress. Uh, so then we kind of moved down here, 2004, this is a very significant piece that happened here in public education. The response to, to intervention model uh, that came out of IDEA required school districts to use this approach to uh, early identify students who are at risk. And, and really up to this point and to this present day, too often students who struggle are quickly transitioned into specialized programs, highly restrictive programs, i.e. special education. And what RTI was the first, uh, the first piece of trying to get schools and school districts to look at kids as individuals and really identify where their, um, where their risk factors were. And then to address those prior to providing a tag of special education to a kid. That continues to this day to be an issue and we are concentrating on it and I'll speak about that in a second here. 2009, very significant moment that many people are not aware of, but, but President Obama in his Race to the Top initiative provided over $4 billion uh, and it was designed to induce reform in K-12 education specifically through the development of high quality online and free resources. And probably the most famous of those that came out was, uh, was, was New York, uh, who put together uh, open educational resources that are available today and are, are constantly being updated. So that's, that's really available free to any educator, any family, any student in America. Of course, 2009, the Common Core came in again under a lot of scrutiny, but uh, the Common Core has been uh, transformative in, in public education in a number of ways. And uh, it really has brought together, it's, it's an integration of the disciplines and it's provided multiple ways for students to access and conceptualize learning. Uh, 2009, we began to see game-based learning come into play. Uh, we saw a revolt in the mid uh you know, 2010s uh, with regards to excessive use of standardized tests. And we're really hoping as we emerge from the pandemic that those singular measures of achievement really become less relevant and that we are constantly engaged in formative assessment of students. So as 2020 hit and COVID surged, uh, we were forced into distance learning and never has there been a more powerful moment because um, for years and years and years, we've been pushing on trying to get to uh, individualization and uh, the use of remote resources. And in one singular moment on one fateful weekend in March of 2020, we made that pivot over. Uh, in 2021, schools reopened, uh, but we found with large numbers, in fact, here in Claremont, it was about 250 kids who uh, elected to remain remote. And this demanded an alternative approach uh, to, to the future here. So here we are in 2022 and we're awaiting 
uh, from state and federal agencies, the new funding models that are going to support these new realities, because you're, we're never going to put that genie back in the bottle. Tried to go through that as fast as I could, because I want to get to this, but really, as I described that history of, of K-12 education there, there's really been an ebb and flow of traditional versus progressive educational policies, and I won't spend a ton of time on this. You can look at it. But where we are today, if you look in that right column under the progressive model of education, uh, where school's a part of life, well, we're now feeding children breakfast and lunch, and I, I don't doubt very soon dinner will come into play. And uh, as a result of being remote, learners have had to be active participants. Their teachers have had to be facilitators and guides. And by the way, parents have become primary teachers or even co-teachers um, having to help their children at home. Uh, the community has become an extension of the program. We're now looking at, uh, of course, partnering with our communities, our communities at large, uh, with regards to universal Wi-Fi, which is something that's going to be needed uh, down the line here. Um, and we're, we're looking at knowledge, which is constructed through experience and how the disciplines are integrated. So you can see, if you look on the left, most of us, maybe on this call, grew up in a traditional <laughs> approach to education, learning, and school. And our students today are experiencing something very different. So kind of the title of this presentation, what was the uh, net result of the pandemic and what it brought to the surface? Well, first of all, it brought a need for a more personalized approach to education, uh, individualized instruction, a, a diverse variety of educational experiences and program learning experiences, um, the differentiation. So differentiation has become a big part of uh, what we need to do as, as educators. And educators have been differentiating really for quite a long time, uh, but now it really comes down to identifying what those individual needs are of our kids and differentiating along those lines as approach to instructional strategies, more this, the learner-centered approach to differentiation. Um, and then our multi-tier systems of supports also, um, we need to continue to train our teachers on that and just to give you a, what that is, if you're not familiar with it, um, we need to look at students from both a behavioral lens and mental and social emotional learning lens, as well as an academic lens. And, when, and to provide our teachers with the training necessary to intervene in moments in classrooms along both of those continuums. And when that's not effective for students to provide targeted interventions for those kids, both from the behavioral, mental, social, emotional health side and the academic side. And then only in extreme cases do we need to actually take a kid and reprogram that child into a special needs program. So we need a more personalized approach uh, to education moving forward. And, um, and, and that really means, again, identifying where, where those kids are and what those gaps are and addressing them. And then equity issues. What has been brought to light in this pandemic, certainly issues of equity. First of all, um, you know, nutritionally, so pre-pandemic versus post-pandemic, there's been an increase in school lunches and breakfasts of 30.7% nationwide. Let that number sink in for a second. It's a high cost item, but it also what it brings to light is that pre-pandemic, probably quite a few of our children nationwide were not getting the nutrition they needed. And so part of this closing the achievement gap and the equity gap is through this nutrition issue. Also, technology access. Um, at the start of the pandemic, it was discovered that uh, about 15% of households with school-age children lacked internet access. And so uh, that became a, a huge issue right at the beginning of the pandemic. And our distance learning was to provide um, accessibility for families. And that was pretty effectively done with the use of hotspots sent home. And here in Claremont, our wonderful Apple initiative um, having an iPad in the hand of every child as they went home. Um, iPads are, as you know, are, are very accessible for students and kids are very intuitive. And it proved to be a, a very wise choice of the Claremont School District when that decision was made to go with Apple devices versus Chrome, uh, Chrome devices. Also, another equity issue is instructional support. We kind of operate along the lines of access plus opportunities plus resources plus support really equals unlimited potential for what students may do, may create, and may understand. So another huge issue we're all aware of from the pandemic is the deep polarization of the nation, read the state and community, which impacts our schools. And uh, certainly we've seen that play out um, 
in boardrooms across America and most recently even in Claremont. Um, and I think what we see there is that um, folks feel a frustration at not having access to regional, statewide or federal politicians and politics. And so uh, most of that unhappiness and frustration lands at the feet of our school boards and our city councils. And uh, certainly we've had a bit of that here in Claremont, but certainly not what we've seen elsewhere. So, uh, and a fifth element of the pandemic that I, I wanted to highlight is this um, a lack of agility and adaptability. Of course, we all know that K-12 education is a very, very, very large bureaucracy and not unlike trying to fit the Queen Mary into a slip uh, down in the docks. Um, so that lack of agility, uh, for instance, in, in having to work with our bargaining units, and this is not a criticism, it's just a fact that um, as we made shifts in and out of distance learning with regards to things like vaccinations and uh, PPE uh, and really reopening classrooms, we've, we've really had to, through public education, construct memorandums of understandings really for everything. And just in Claremont, I can tell you that in one year's time, there were over 30 plus bargaining sessions um, to get to that ability to open. So that's part of what we have to be able to deal with. Um, secondly, learning management platforms for K-12 are very late to the game. I think uh, higher education has certainly done more work along the lines of learning management systems. And essentially what an LMS is, is it's a place, it's a singular login where teachers and students can access curriculum, resources, records, and attendance. We're scrambling right now. I know in uh, certainly in, in, in Claremont, we use a really great LMS, sort of an LMS called Canvas, but it's not fully integrated. And so there is some lack of agility uh, with regards to that management system. And then funding and attendance issues and what our state is battling with right now, and there are bills before the Senate and the House, is uh, looking at how do we fund our schools that doesn't relate to seat time. And right now we're kind of in, a, in an in-between time where we're being held harmless by the state of California for our funding. But very soon we're going to be funded on, you know, how many kids are sitting in chairs in front of us or in an independent study program. So I know the state is grappling with that right now, but right now that is a source of uh, restrictiveness. So I like to look at opportunities. So what were the opportunities that came out of the pandemic? And uh, certainly the first is the, the need for a permanent presence of an alternative to traditional in-person and traditional independent study. And so, you know, the issues here, personalization, mobility, broad opportunities, college career pathways. Another opportunities is less of a reliance on traditional assessment tools for college acceptance. Simple fact was there wasn't the normal uh, assessment tools available to universities as they look to uh, invite students to their campuses. And so this has been an opportunity to, to look at a child or a student from a holistic standpoint. And certainly our universities are making movement uh, towards that. Uh, we know that the, the SAT, for instance, is gonna go digital in 2024. It, they've already told us it's going to be shorter, it's going to be more relevant content, more integration, and uh, more resources available to students who take that. And we do know that college, colleges around the nation are using test optional or test blind processes. Another opportunity is project-based and whole child learning. Um, again, bringing students uh, diverse experiences and knowledge into the classroom and giving kids a, a, a wider array of tools to um, learn and also to demonstrate their learning. But this is a good one, a big one for me is this constant, this idea of constant formative assessment versus summative tests. Um, the tools that are being used in our classrooms today, an example of that in Claremont is, an, is a program called iReady. It's so interesting to our students. First of all, they're very engaged in it along mathematics and language arts. And at the same time, what they don't know is that they're constantly being assessed and that formative assessment is constantly being shared with their instructors, which gives their instructors the opportunity to help their students in real time, which we know is one of the most powerful effects on learning. And then a concentration on social emotional learning. We're all talking about it. We're all investigating it. We're all providing resources uh, for, our, for our classrooms and for our counselors and psychologists. And so this has become a huge concentration area out of the pandemic. And then the future development of a true learning management system, which I've already addressed. So what is next in K-12? Um, Certainly, we know that a permanent virtual option, as I discussed earlier, where students will be able to access a broader and deeper curriculum, um, there's going to be greater involvement in, in board and district meetings. And I'll pause there and say, 
you know, never have we in Claremont really or anywhere else had the type of attendance in board of education meetings as we do now. And out of the pandemic, um, we have we have opted for and I believe most districts have opted for allowing for both an in-person and virtual experience. So that has increased participation from the community and public uh, board meetings and also things like our LCAP meetings with our school sites. Also administrative meetings. One of the things we've done is not have to have all administrative meetings in the district office. We've allowed sometimes uh, principals or other leaders to remain on their campuses and that's allowed for much more time uh, along the way for them. And then rise of partnerships. So parents as partners, uh, social welfare organizations around vaccinations, mental health, intervention, clothing, things like that. Uh, we've seen greater numbers of partnerships across the spectrum. Certainly with community resources have become so important and Claremont has such a rich uh, variety of community partnerships with the TAC uh, and the YAC through the city, with our CLASP program uh, and our BLAST program through the district and so many other resources that are available out in the community. In fact, one of the ways we were able to test um, uh, community members with, with the uh, COVID status here was through community partnerships. Uh, increased partnerships with governmental agencies, um, education and health, never have <laughs> we had such access to the Department of Public Health and our County Office of Education. We have weekly meetings with the directors of those two. And so it's increased this collaboration and communication across um, our county agencies as well. And then uh, university and community colleges, the rise of partnerships. Uh, internships, school to college or school to career pathways. Uh, we're certainly talking to increase our dual enrollment possibilities with Citrus College um, and many other hybrid partnerships which are underway. So this is another opportunity from the pandemic. And then industry um, with school to career and school and school to college to career um, through our CTE or career tech ed pathway programs. And also with our really wonderful partnership that we have with the Baldy View ROP, where our students are able to take uh, technical courses, uh, both at Claremont High School and at the campus uh, at Baldy View. So uh, these are all wonderful partnerships that we're going to continue to explore in public education. And then finally, the what's next, I, I mentioned earlier, the shifts in school district funding. And again, legislation underway to Identify, identify a different way to fund schools. Instead of looking at average daily attendance, I know the push is looking towards true enrollment and enrollment could be in a multi, multitude of programs. So that's kind of the what's next piece. And then I wanted to jump into just sort of the, I love talking the exciting stuff that uh, kind of where we're going. And uh, certainly there's some top ed tech trends moving forward. I had the opportunity to be at a conference last week uh, where I met with a couple of individuals who are doing just amazing work in augmented reality and virtual reality and giving students an opportunity to uh, experience their learning. And, uh, and, and, and it's exciting. I think you heard that initial video. When, when AR and VR is utilized in, in learning, there's as much as a 70% increase in, uh, in the amount of information and the experiences that students actually uh, internalize. So first of all, an AI powered learning using, you know, uh, AI, we will allow teachers to offer more targeted and personalized education evaluation modules. So the idea that with big data and with the disaggregation of that data and, and you know, putting it in a useful form for teachers, it's going to give them a much better opportunity in real time to address individual needs with our students. Uh, and also to create evaluation modules that might look completely different from one student to the next. Also, we're looking forward very soon, I think, to multilingual translators, enhancing the experience and knowledge level of our educators and improving the learning of our students. Um, asynchronous learning for diverse learners. Uh, certainly during this pandemic, uh, we had a variety of hybrid experiences for students. We had you know, teachers in real time with students, students um, participating in asynchronous learning, and we're getting better and better with that. And uh, but again, getting back to the idea of personalizing the experience for every student, some, we all know students learn very differently in different ways in different spaces and different times. And for so long, we've tried to fit all those different learning needs into one box and sort of create this manufacturing model of education. And certainly with these diverse learning tools um, and, and experiences, students will have a better opportunity to learn in their most effective place, space and time. And then the, uh, 
you know, the, the digital learning tools, the expansion, it's, it's such an exciting time right now emerging from the pandemic that these learning tools are really appearing, you know, daily and this opportunity uh, to bring these into our classrooms is just really exciting for administrators and teachers alike. Uh, more accessible learning, another ed tech, ed, ed tech trend moving forward. So I mentioned iReady and online quizzes and feedback, on-demand instructional videos, online tools to check for academic integrity is a huge issue right now. And so this idea of providing a personalized learning experience is using those digital tools uh, did to create digital profiles of students. And in fact, uh, one, of my, uh, one of my trips to China uh, several years ago, I was able to go to an experimental school. It was really exciting. And what they had done is they were graduating some of their first classes of kids who had been in the school since kindergarten. And they had been tracking through video, the students' videos, sort of their developmental phases of their education. So I was able to watch an entire uh, K-12 experience of one student as, as he described it to us in person. He showed us his video. And it was really, really interesting to watch how that personalized learning experience that he had, had really shaped his entire educational journey and through to university and career. I also mentioned that uh, augmented reality, visual reality, um, visualization and virtual representation of natural events, field trips, uh, demonstrations, uh, looking at structures. One of the videos I thought about showing you guys, but uh, we're gonna run out of time here is, um, you know, our students are able to explore, for instance, anatomy or architecture or engineering uh, through augmented reality or virtual reality uh, tools. And th these are available now and the content is expanding daily. So this is another exciting ed tech trend. I would imagine walking into a, uh, a classroom in 10 years in Claremont and seeing students on uh, augmented reality, uh, you know, goggles or whatever that device will be by then and perhaps uh, things like holograms and other things that work. Um, and then uh, coming out again, consistent professional development of educators. This has always been a weakness in California. Certainly our, our teachers have to teach the entire day pretty much. They get a very short prep time uh, to really prepare themselves for their classes each day. We have to somehow navigate and figure out how we can provide the necessary professional development that our teachers need to ensure that they're staying on top of the latest uh, tech trends and preparing our kids for a life beyond school. Um, that you know that we can prepare for uh, digital transformation and troubleshooting. These are all things that are going to be necessary to pro provide for our teachers as they move forward. And then finally, the idea of nano learning modules for learning and skill enhancement. I've already spoken about this, but the idea that that educators will have access to a pool of small learning and skill development modules they can assign to students based on the analysis of their digital profile. So again, that individualization, that personalization, creating modules for our students. We do have a few dangers that lie ahead. We're, we're pretty familiar now. We're, we've done a lot of talking about uh, declining mm -hmm. enrollment statewide. It's a statewide and regional issue. Um, you know, the last census revealed that California's population did drop and folks are moving further out of the urban areas to find affordable housing. This has become a huge issue. In fact, I just read that Azusa Unified, really close to where I live, is uh, closing five schools at once, consolidating three middle schools into one. Um, and there's a widespread declining enrollment in our, in our area. And that's gonna impact, uh, of course, our funding. And it's gonna impact the uh, variety of programs that we can offer. Another danger is the funding formula. Uh, right now we have what's called the local control funding formula where every student in the state of California is worth a set amount of dollars. Uh, let's just say, let's just use as an example, $10,000. So every school district gets funded $10,000 for every student. Then for every student who is a socioeconomically disadvantaged child, a foster youth or a second language learner, the school district gets 20% above the base for that student. And then if 55% or greater of your student body matches one of those categories, the, you get a 50% concentration grant on top of that. So the, the, the model I like to talk about here is you could have a child living in Claremont and right across the freeway, a child living in Pomona. And the difference that those two school districts would get for those two students would, could be as much as $7,000 um, for that student. So the, 
the legislature has recognized that it, while it's a great it's a great idea because you're getting resources to where uh, needier students need them, uh, that perhaps they're going to have to adjust that formula because it's created a, a wide disparity in school district funding uh, for schools that don't have large numbers of kids like that. And honestly, school districts like Claremont, Glendora, you know, Arcadia, San Marino are really being forced into a position of having to go to their community for parcel taxes and things like that to close that uh, financial gap. And then, you know, another danger that lies ahead, the widening of the achievement gap. I put that little bubble there on the right. Uh, Asian households, mainly in China, Japan, and South Korea, spend around 15% of their household income on supplemental educational services, such as tuition, compared to just 2% in the USA. So there is a, certainly a widening of the achievement gap internationally. But when you look at the pandemic and, and all the issues that we've talked about today, students who grow up in educated households who have you know, the space to work and have the access to um, internet and technology, who have parents who aren't having to work two jobs um, and have the time to spend with their children, all of these issues are ca causing a widening of the achievement gap. And so uh, this is going to be a danger. This is going to be something that we all have to deal with in education is to uh, continue to address the needs of our students who are most at risk. Workforce issues are, are becoming huge in education. To just be blunt, not many people want to go into education right now. And we're struggling not in Claremont, really, but in, in education throughout the nation to find workers, to find things like instructional aides, because instructional aides are asked to do a lot. And to be you know, perfectly honest, they're not making a lot of money to do that. And, uh, and, and teachers are you know, being put in the crosshairs of unhappy you know, parents and principals the same as, as, as we all have been. So workforce issues are our struggle right now. So we don't, we, it's really tough for us to find substitute teachers. And it's really tough for us to fill some of our vacancies. And then, of course, uh, homeschools, chargers, vouchers continue to chip away at uh, our, our comprehensive K-12 education, which is a, a funding issue for us, and that's a danger. And then this polarized political landscape that we talked about. These are all dangers that sort of uh, threaten us in the future. So just kind of to wrap this up here, uh, looking at classrooms in the future, a national survey was conducted, uh, and it showed that seven instructional tools that came out of the pandemic were favored with uh, over 50% of those responding, saying that they would continue to integrate and expand. Uh, a lot of what we talked about today, project-based learning, uh, on-demand instructional videos, um, on online tools to ensure academic integrity, online polling or quizzes, uh, mastery-based learning labs or simulations, and individualized learning progressions and pacing. So these are all tools that um, I, I don't want to say teachers were forced <laughs> to integrate because that's not the right way to put it. Teachers needed to integrate these in the pandemic. And um, as they began to add to their tool belt, they recognized um, how effective some of these tools could be. And they're, so they're doubling down on it. When they came back into their classrooms, they're continuing to use these tools. And, and, and really, our students are benefiting. And I think if from nothing else, from the um, feedback that they're getting in a formative way in real time. And uh, John Hattie, if you're familiar with John Hattie, the New Zealander uh, researcher who's done the largest meta-analysis of educational impacts in the world um, over time, and he continues to add to his research. As, uh, and what he looks at is effects on or impacts on learning. And one of the most powerful impacts that we can give our kids is immediate feedback. And I think if there was one thing that I could say that came out of this pandemic, uh, that's made the greatest amount of difference in our classrooms is that immediate impact or that immediate feedback that our teachers are able to give each of our kids. So that's it for my presentation. And I'm right at the 40 minute mark. So I'm going to stop and just see if we have any questions. And so I'll go back to Zoom and I'm going to stop sharing here. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh... Jeff, I greatly appreciate it. And uh, so let me uh, ask if there are any questions. Uh, you can just simply unmute yourself and shoot away. Oh, 
Okay, please. We have a question from the uh, in-person audience. Wonderful. Thank you all for hanging in there with me. I know that was a lot. <laughs> I was there was there were moments where I was wondering if you all were still there. <laughs> it, was fast. it was a lot to digest. Um, I was I'm a former kindergarten teacher and all of these terms. Uh, so many things are new. Um, I was just thinking back to my days and thinking that uh, in um, special education, uh, the, there was the IEP and it was very individualized. And when I went into a regular classroom, I thought, oh, this is great. I can individualize for all of my students. But, you know, this is leaps and bounds ahead of that. But uh, uh, I, it, I just wanted, it didn't even have a question. I just thought this is so amazing that you brought this to our attention. And I feel like I was trying to take names down so I could look up some of your resources and keep going. But uh, thank you so much. And do you think that people, I mean, is it your view that in special ed, there was that individualized uh, attention for the student before it entered the regular classroom? Yeah, that's a that's a wonderful question, and and honestly, where where I think we need to go is an individualized educational program for every student. And really, what this was all about is, and that's really where I think K twelve education is heading is an IEP for every kid. So I would say special education and special education teachers like you uh, really have set that standard for the rest of K twelve education. It's always been about resource allocation, right? Because to do an IEP for every student in the old or traditional way of of education was impossible. There just weren't the resources for it. But, you know, and the thing you got to remember about technology is technology is only good if it's a lever, right? If it's a lever for something else. And certainly with technology, we can accelerate access to uh, curriculum and instructional resources. We can accelerate feedback. We can, we can formatively look at how students are performing and give them that feedback. So really, it, it, you know, bringing the, all this together, and I gave you a lot, but bringing all this together in a learning management system that's easily accessible for teachers, students, and parents, right? That's going to create this feedback loop that's constant, and that's going to allow us to address the needs of each of our kids in the way that really special education has been doing for years. Any other questions? Well, thank you. I don't. I don't see any questions. So I want to let me let me thank you. Uh, I I agree. Um, the information was was extraordinary. Uh, you got to clap. Me too. I'm gonna clap as well. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And um, uh, the the session has been recorded, so you can go back and take a look at at uh, the the resources and the citations that uh, uh, Jeff Wilson has provided. Jeff, thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Happy to be here. Thank you so much.